in 2013, I went to document a story on windmills and the biodiversity that lives around it. We all know that thousands of birds die every year by colliding to windmill blades and uh, there's more to that story which I discovered after reaching here to the Chalkewadi Plateau in the northwestern Maharashtra. Windmills came into this landscape almost 35 years ago and they are spread across half of the plateau. This plateau is also home to this beautiful looking lizard known as the fan-throated lizard. Now studies from Indian Institute of Sciences shows that the numbers of these lizards have gone way higher in the areas where there are windmills compared to the areas where there are no windmills. What caused this? It seems like this is a result of absence of aerial predation. Eagles and other raptors avoid windmills and as they are not coming there because windmills are scary for them. More interestingly, higher densities or higher numbers are in affecting their uh, entire competition. It is resulting into higher competition and less opportunities for feeding, which eventually is resulting into a change in their body size and color. All this happened in less than 25 years, which is really interesting. I don't know if windmills, windmills are definitely greener alternatives, but I'm not sure if uh, windmills are the greenest alternatives. I don't know about that, but what I know is that this story is really interesting. And as a science photographer, I try to understand, document, and bring out these science stories and the wonders of natural world to the audience. Natural world was not something new for me. I grew up in central India, in the very forest ranges where Rudyard Kipling wrote his epic book, The Jungle Book. I'm kind of blessed that my childhood was spent here at my father's farm in the middle of a jungle with tigers and leopards roaming around in our backyard. I'm lucky that I was isolated, partially isolated from civilization, but still it was content. My life was content. And uh, I had freedom to do whatever I wanted to do. Uh, I mean, not whatever, I still had to go to school and finish my bachelor's and master's, which turned out to be good because during my, my master's, I uh, stumbled upon molecular ecology and I realized the power of molecular tools to understand the wonders of natural world. And I ended up becoming a molecular ecologist at National Center for Biological Sciences. And I, as part of my research, I used to walk around in jungles collecting tiger samples. This picture was not taken with a telephoto lens. While walking, I found myself standing almost 10 feet away from the tiger and the forest guard who was supposed to, who was accompanying me, was actually hiding behind me. Unfortunately, this was the last day of my field work and after this, shit work started. Literally, shit work. <laughs> I got grounded to a lab where I was extracting DNA from tiger poop and was using molecular tools to understand tiger ecology. After a couple of years, this study got published in an international journal and I went home to show it to my mother with a lot of excitement. My mom looked at the paper and then she looked at me and she said, son, I love you and I'm very proud of you, but I have no clue what this paper means. <laughs> I think that was the moment when I realized that there's this big gap that exists between scientific and non-scientific community. Uh, people outside my institute had no clue what the big deal about conservation and wildlife sciences was about. And uh, one of the reasons for that is the fact that the language of science is very objective and technical because it has to be. As a photographer all my life, I think images are a very nice visual medium to tell stories. And to me, an uh, idea of a tool which can take a moment from time and give it to infinity is just fascinating. So, and I had access to this tool. I had a camera, so I thought I'll use camera to tell these science stories. I started collaborating with, with my fellow researchers to tell their science stories to a larger audience. This is the most colorful bird that I've ever seen. It's a Himalayan monal, and my first story took me to Eastern Himalaya, where I documented the effects of climate change on the local biodiversity. I got these stories published in national level magazines and forums, but I felt that my reach was restricted. Even though these uh, stories were documented in India, the, effect, the, the issues that they were representing were fairly global. So I started looking for international forums. And things changed for me in 2014. I got funded by National Geographic to produce a story on 
evolution of species in the Western Ghats of India. So it's been a few years I'm working in the Western Ghats, essentially in the southern part, in the sky islands of these Western Ghats. Now what are sky islands? Sky islands are these mountains peaking out of the clouds, and as they are high up in the sky, they are called as sky islands. They are very similar to oceanic islands, just that they are surrounded by sea of clouds instead of waters. And in very simpler words, they are just like Galapagos, but high up in the sky. And these sky islands are home to many species, uh, uh, home to a very unique forest known as the Shola forest. This forest exists only on these mountain tops. It is very moist in nature, and all the major rivers in South India originate in this forest. And this forest is also home to very crazy looking creatures, such as this Rajasthus signatus, or a star-eyed frog. It is found only in these forests. Now more interestingly, these forest patches, small patches, are floating in the sea of grasslands. Now grasslands are on the hills, and the forests are in the valleys. And these grasslands have their very own species, which just prefers to live in them, such as this Nilgiri Thar, which just lives in the grass, grasslands. I started exploring these mountains as part of my project. And on one of those instances, me and a friend of mine, we were looking for the smallest frog of India. We knew its location, and we went to that forest patch. We entered the forest, and I heard the frog call. I thought I found it. It was calling from this two square meter area, and it was hiding under the leaf litter. And because of its small size and amazing camouflage, it took me close to three hours to locate this guy. This frog is known as Nictibatracus minimus, and it is as small as my thumb. Now, study shows that this frog is found in very few pockets of Western Ghats and nowhere else in the world. Now, what caused this evolution? What made these species so unique and so restricted and so specific to grasslands and forests? To understand this mystery, I collaborated with Dr. Uma Ramakrishnan and Dr. Robin, and right now I'm in a process to, to make a film to tell this story to a larger audience. But for now, if you ever happen to be in Western Ghats, in the mountains of Western Ghats, and if you see a sea of cloud below you, be sure that you are standing on one of these sky islands with so much of uniqueness around you. But today, these sky islands are not only isolated by deep valleys and sea of clouds, they are also isolated by dense urbanization. And I wanted to document that, so I decided to do a time lapse. Time lapse is a process in which we set up a camera and program it, and the camera keeps taking pictures on its own. Each image in this time lapse is exposed for 15 seconds. And I let the camera flow for the entire night, and next morning when we looked at the camera, uh, looked at the images, I realized that along with the landscape, I got something totally out of the world, a green meteorite. Now, this is probably the only composed photo of a green meteorite, and frankly speaking, no photographer can, can plan this shot, because this guy can show up for a fraction of a second anywhere in the universe. Today, the best way to represent this image or explain this image is the fact that for those 15 seconds, I was probably the, the luckiest photographer on the planet. And it, this image actually also challenges me uh, philosophically. I grew up thinking and reading that each image is made up of only three components. The subject, the technicalities, and the aesthetics of the photographer. This image makes me rethink that concept. It makes me believe that every image is made up of only two components, a reality and a dream. And a memorable image is the one where you can't tell the difference. Thank you.